Uh, welcome back to this next video and this is the uh, fourth video in the series of videos on the uh, protein kinase A pathway. Uh, in the last video I've told you that when the ligand that was the epinephrine when it binds to its receptors uh, that is actually uh, uh, causing a conformation changes in the interior part of the receptor and converting the receptor into a guanine nucleotide exchange factor is the receptors they are in uh, connection with the G protein so when the uh, interior of the receptor work as a guanine nucleotide exchange factor it actually uh, replace the GDP which is attached to the alpha subunit of the G protein into a GTP thereby activating the uh, alpha subunit of the uh, G uh, heterotrimeric G protein what the uh, alpha G protein what the uh, alpha part of the G protein which is now attached to the uh, GTP it go and it activate another enzyme which was the adenyl cyclase and what the uh, adenyl cyclase it was doing that it was going for the conversion of the ATP into the cyclic AMP now what the uh, cyclic AMP is doing that cyclic AMP is now going for the activation of the protein kinase A. So in this particular video we are going to focus on the uh, structure of the protein kinase A in details and about the uh, different subunits that are present in the uh, protein kinase A. Now the uh, protein kinase A it is also known as the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase uh, and you will see in a while why it is called is the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase and the protein kinase A is also known as the kinase A. So these three terms they are actually referring to uh, one in the same protein. Is the a protein kinase A, it is kinase in nature, this means that it is going to add a phosphate group on specific amino acid in its substrate protein. So when you talk specifically about the protein kinase A, the protein kinase A is a serine threonine kinase. What I mean by that is that when the protein kinase A, it interacts with its substrate protein, it is going to add a phosphate group on the serine or threonine amino acids in that particular substrate protein. So this is uh, making it a specific kinase that the protein kinase A is a serine threonine kinase. If you talk about the uh, inactive holoenzyme structure of the protein kinase A, so the inactive holoenzyme of the protein kinase A have got two catalytic subunits and two uh, regulatory subunits and both of these uh, these two regulatory and these two uh, catalytic subunits are making the uh, inactive holo protein kinase A enzyme. If you uh, look into the details of the catalytic subunit it actually have got three important regions. Now one of the regions in the catalytic subunit that is known as the ATP binding site is this is a kinase it should have an ATP binding site so that it can convert that ATP into ADP and it can actually add a phosphate group in its substrate protein so the catalytic subunit have got one ATP binding site another important uh, site that is present in the catalytic subunit that is known as the substrate binding site and this substrate binding site it actually gives the catalytic subunit the ability to bind to its substrate protein so that the specific amino acids can be phosphorylated it also got the uh, regulatory subunit binding site and this is actually the site where the uh, regulatory subunits they are binding and they are actually regulating the activity of the catalytic subunit and hence the protein kinase A and this is the of course the carboxy terminal so this will be the N terminal then you have got the ATP binding site then the substrate binding site you have got a regulatory subunit binding site and then uh, a carboxylic acid so this is the C terminal and this is the end terminal of the uh, catalytic subunit. When you talk about the, uh, the regulatory subunits, the regulatory subunit have also got specific uh, regions. 
one of the uh, important regions in the uh, regulatory subunit that is known as the dimerization and docking domain it is also called is sometime is the docking and dimerization domain so the dimerization and docking or the docking and dimerization domain it actually refers to uh, this particular part of the regulatory subunits and we will discuss the function of this particular domain in a while the regulatory subunit have got another important site which is known as the auto inhibitory or it is known as the pseudo substrate site and then you have got the uh, cyclic amp binding site in the uh, regulatory subunit and the regulatory subunit actually have got uh, two cyclic amp binding sites that means that to one regulatory subunit two molecules of the cyclic amp can bind therefore i have shown uh, two c's over here so these uh, one c is actually referring to one cyclic amp binding site this another c is for another cyclic amp binding site and then you have got the uh, uh, carboxylic end over here so this is the n terminal of the regulatory subunit this is the c terminal of the regulatory subunit what this mean is that catalytic subunit is a complete protein the regulatory subunit is a complete protein therefore it have the n terminal as well as the uh, c terminal now when the uh, protein kinase a that is in the inactive form uh, how it looks like now this is the uh, diagram where i am showing you the uh, inactive holo enzyme uh, as you have seen in the structure that the uh, this one that I have highlighted in the blue over here the, this is the catalytic subunit and this one is the catalytic subunit and in between I have shown these two uh, regulatory subunits. Now if you look at this structure I am highlighting this uh, blue one uh, in the catalytic subunit is the substrate binding site. So when there is, uh, when the uh, protein kinase A is in the inactive form, in that particular case, the pseudo, the auto inhibitory site or the pseudo substrate site, which is present in the regulatory domain, that is actually in interaction with the uh, substrate binding site. This means that the catalytic subunit is it's already bound with a substrate, so it will not be able to interact with the uh, the other substrate therefore the catalytic subunit that is in the inactive form or you can simply say that the substrate binding site of the catalytic domain that have been masked by the pseudo substrate or the auto inhibitory uh, site of the regulatory subunit thereby making the uh, catalytic subunit inactive if you look at this one, uh, this uh, I'm talking about the two regulatory subunits now. And if you see over here, uh, this one, uh, as I've shown in the uh, yellow color over here, this is the uh, dimerization domain. Um, we will discuss about this uh, docking function in a while, but here I'm only focusing on the dimerization function of this dimerization and docking domain. And if you see over here, the two regulatory subunits, they are actually in interaction with each other, utilizing this dimerization domain. And this di actually refers to two. That means that this particular uh, site is going to attach two regulatory subunits to each other. Therefore, it is is the uh, dimerization domain and then you have got the uh, two cyclic AMP binding site over here and then you have got the uh, two cyclic AMP binding site on the uh, other regulatory subunits so in the uh, inactive holo enzyme form the uh, substrate binding site of the catalytic subunit is masked by the uh, auto inhibitory or the pseudo substrate site of the regulatory subunits and the regulatory subunits are actually interacting with each other utilizing their dimerization and uh, docking domain and the two cyclic AMP sites of course they are there in the uh, regulatory subunits now what happens is when the uh, adenyl cyclase or which we are calling for short is the ac so when the ac converts the uh, atp into the cyclic amp what happens is that the cyclic amp are now going to interact with the uh, cyclic amp binding site over here I'm showing the cyclic AMP like these uh, short, uh, small squares over here. So as I've told you to one regulatory subunits, 
to cyclic AMP they can bind and to another uh, regulatory subunit to cyclic AMP they will be binding over here. So what happens is when the concentration of the cyclic AMP increases because of the activation of the uh, adenylyl cyclase enzyme the cyclic AMP are going to interact with the uh, cyclic AMP binding sites two with each of the regulatory subunits so a total of four cyclic AMP they are actually interacting with the uh, inactive hodo enzyme and specifically their uh, regulatory subunits when the cyclic AMP that points over here it is going to cause a conformational change and when a, a conformational change take place the catalytic subunits they are released so the binding of the cyclic AMP is actually causing a conformational change in the regulatory subunits and when there is a conformational change they are actually going to release the catalytic subunits and now the catalytic subunits they are free to act on their substrates. What I mean by that is that these catalytic subunits are now going to phosphorylate their uh, particular substrates. We will discuss that in a while. When you talk about the uh, protein kinase A, uh, there are, as you can see, two kinds of the protein kinase A. And these two types are based on the uh, regulatory subunits that are present in the protein kinase A. So the regulatory subunits in the protein kinase A, they are of two types. One type is known as the R1 regulatory subunits and the other one is known as the R2 regulatory subunits. If a protein kinase A is using the uh, R1 regulatory subunits, those particular protein kinase A are known as the type 1 protein kinase A. And if they are using the uh, type 2 uh, regulatory subunits or the R2 regulatory subunits, then the protein kinase A is known as the type 2 protein kinase A. If you talk about the R1 regulatory subunits or the type 1 regulatory subunits, uh, there are two types. One is known as the R1 alpha and the other one is known as the R1 beta. So the R1 have further two, uh, uh, two types you can see. One is known as the R1 alpha and the other one is known as the R1 beta. Now, as I've told you that uh, for a uh, holo enzyme, there must be two uh, regulatory subunits. So if you are using the R1 as your regulatory subunits, you can actually have the homodimers or you can actually have the heterodimers. What I mean by that is that if you are making a protein kinase A, you need two uh, regulatory subunits. So in the case of the homodimers, what you can use is you can use two copies of the R1 alpha you can use two copies of the R1 beta. So if you are using two copies of the R1 alpha, that means you are using the R1 alpha homodimers. If you are choosing two of your catalytic subunits to be R1 beta, then you will be having the R1 beta homodimer as part of your protein kinase A. But you can also use uh, the heterodimers. You can use one as the R1 alpha and the other one is the R1 beta, making the two uh, regulatory subunits of the type 1 protein kinase A. When you talk about the um, type 2 regulatory subunits or the R2, you do not have the options of the heterodimers. You have to use the homodimers. What I mean by that is if you are choosing two regulatory subunits for the type 2 protein kinase A, you can uh, only use uh, two copies of the R2 alpha. That means both of the uh, both of the regulatory subunits in that particular protein kinase A that will be made of R2 alpha. Or you can also use the R2 beta as two uh, regulatory subunits of the type 2 protein kinase A but you cannot use a one as the R2 alpha and the other one is the R2 beta as you can you have the choice in the uh, type 1 uh, reg uh, the type 1 or the R1 uh, regulatory subunits so the regulatory subunits are of two types the R1 and the R2 and based on these uh, regulatory subunits you can have type 1 protein kinase A if you are using the R1 regulatory subunits can have type 2 protein kinase A if you are using the R2 regulatory subunits. 
one important thing to keep in mind is that you cannot uh, mix these two families with each other like you cannot uh, use the uh, one of your regulatory subunit is the r1 alpha and the other one is the r2 beta you cannot actually uh, mix these uh, two families of the regulatory subunits you can you have you can uh, mix over here only in this particular family you cannot actually mix these two as well you have to use either the homodimer of the r2 alpha or the homodimer of the R2 beta but in case of the R1 you can use the homodimer as well as the heterodimer to make your uh, protein kinase A. If you talk about the catalytic subunits there are also three types of the catalytic subunits one the C alpha the other one is the C beta or the other one is the C gamma so this C is actually referring to the catalytic subunits so you can have catalytic subunit alpha catalytic subunit beta or the catalytic subunit gamma so if you are making for example the uh, uh, type 1 protein kinase a the options that are available you can use the for example the c alpha two catalytic subunits of the c alpha and you can actually have uh, the r1 alpha homodimer or the r uh, r1 alpha homodimer or the r1 beta homodimer or you can actually use the heterodimers uh, so this means that you can have a variety of the combinations uh, when you talk about the uh, protein kinase a with respect to the uh, regulatory and the uh, catalytic subunits now the uh, type 1 and the type 2 protein kinase a or these isoforms they differ in their localization that means they are present in different cells or the different parts of the cells they are also different in their expression expression level and uh, they are believed to have uh, different differential sensitivities for the uh, cyclic amp as well so depending on the protein kinase a depending on the type of the protein kinase a you can have differences in their localization expression level and sensitivity for the uh, cyclic amp now these properties like this localization expression level or the sensitivities for the cyclic amp properties they are actually the determining factors that dictate their physiological roles or that dictate, dictates the uh, physical physiological roles of the uh, protein kinase a one other important thing about the uh, uh, protein kinase A is that they are attached to cell membrane like I'm drawing these two lines to represent the cell membrane or it can be the membrane of any other organelle within the cell. So the protein kinase A they are attached to these cell membrane indirectly by another set of protein which is known as the A cap. What this A cap mean is this A is for A, this K is for kinase, this A is for anchoring and this P is for protein. So these A kinase anchoring protein are actually attaching the uh, protein kinase A to the cell membrane of the cell or to the membrane of any other organelle. Eh? Now, if you uh, talk about the literature, in the literature, uh, most of the time it is said that only the uh, type 2 protein kinase A, they utilize their uh, docking and dimerization domain. Uh, so this is the uh, time where I should uh, give you the idea about this uh, uh, docking domain over here. If you look at over here, the uh, type 2 protein kinase A, that is utilizing its uh, docking domain over here to interact with the A kinase anchoring protein and with the help of this uh, docking domain it is actually immobilized or it is attached to the cell membrane or membrane of any other organelle. Now the uh, A kinase anchoring protein they, what they do is that they actually uh, vary in localization and structure uh, but it all shares the ability to uh, bind to the uh, protein kinase A. Uh, we will uh, discuss the, uh, we will continue this uh, discussion in the, uh, the next video.